I'm going to talk to you about how we could potentially save human lives. Isn't that important? Okay, great. At a cusp of global changes, the population is actually growing, which is a good, it is good thing or bad thing, depending on who you will ask. And at the same time, we also have some challenges with disease burden. Imagine that you are 50, you're more likely to get an infectious disease, an antimicrobial, drug-resistant infectious disease than a cancer or diabetes. Do you want that? No, okay. So by 2050, we'll be around 9 billion humans. Around 9 billion humans. And at the same time, we will be hitting new statistics in terms of different diseases. So both the disease burden will increase, we'll have new outbreaks, and at the same time, we have to make sure that the population will age gracefully. So what do we do about this problem? We have to take care of our patients. We have to use technology for this. But then the other side of that is, when, with the increasing technology adoption, we don't have you know, uh, that's not converging to what we call as optimized care. The, the cost of care is actually increasing. We are spending way too much money to take care of our patients. This is the example from the US, but this is the same around the globe. So we have a huge challenge here. So who could be a savior in this setting? Data. How many of you have heard about big data? A lot of hands here. So whether the data is big, deep, small, or even little crumbs of data, in the context of healthcare, have the power to help you, to help you to live longer, to help you to find a potential cure for a disease, to, to combat a, a disease like Nipah virus. So the data could actually help you. It could save lives. And what I do for a living is data science. I'm a healthcare and biomedical data science practitioner. At work, my daughter sometimes asks me and I kind of explain to her, she kind of thinks that I do something with data. She kind of thinks, you know, I'm developing some data robots, which is kind of, you know, okay. And, but what media thinks of my job? For example, Harvard Business Review called data science the sexiest job in the world. And what, what I actually do, I do a combination of things that you, all of you are doing, like a bit of computer science, a bit of information technology, a bit of statistics, a bit of quantitative modeling, and I apply all of that to a particular domain or a business knowledge. I work exclusively on uh, biomedical science and healthcare and life science problems. How did I end up here? Is there a, you know, I always get this question, is there a master's in, have you done a master's in data science or is there a PhD? No, it's a quite a long story actually. How many of you are backbenchers here? Ooh, that's good, okay. I was one among you guys, okay, sorry, uh, sorry, friend ventures. So after I finished my high school, I did a pre-degree, like which was more of a biology-oriented PBC course, and then, you know, I wanted to be a physician at that time. But then what happened was, the transition from a high school to a pre-degree course was quite a change. And I finished my pre-degree with, uh, you know, just around 50 percentage, let's put it that way. And I couldn't clear neither the state entrance or the national entrance exam like many of you who are in this room. So I took an undergraduate program in physics. That was the only thing that available back then. I did that, but I did it fairly well. And after that, I, I heard about a course called bioinformatics. This is basically using computational technique to biological data. Because back then, around 15 years ago, we, ha we don't have like, a lot of medical data available. So after that master's, I did a PhD from Indian Institute of Science and National Center for Biological Sciences. And I eventually got trained, even though I'm not a physician myself, I got trained at the Mayo Clinic. And I'm sure you've heard about Mayo Clinic before because a lot of our government or you know, our, our uh, elected officials goes there for their, tr their, their, their uh, treatment. So, 
I ended up getting my training from there. And what do I do for work? I work with a lot of health systems, several health systems, and also work with company to basically understand biomedical data and develop you know, a risk prediction algorithms, develop new therapies, or do something called drug repositioning. I'm going to show you three examples today in each of these three categories. So what, what is actually a biomedical and healthcare data? So if you ask me about you know, healthcare data, so we, are current, we currently live in this lower part of the picture. We work with blood pressure, we work with EKG, we work with you know, CT scans. These are like what you call a sec but what really happens is you have a generic code, we all have our genetic material, we have, you know, when the genes are being measured, we get a signature for the genes called transcriptome, and then we have something called proteome, and all the way it goes through the, the physiome of the human body. So what really happens is we have a major limitation because we are currently working in this, you know, these gross phenotypes right now. But where things are going, we started slowly measuring genomes and transcriptomes and proteomes here. And we can collect location-specific data for a patient. We can collect, do a lot of monitoring. You have seen Daniel Kraft's video. We can do a lot of monitoring. And then we can also collect data from your medical record. These are the data that's being collected in the hospitals. And we can apply, you know, whether a, an artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning algorithm that you'll be using to develop a robotics solution or you know electrical engineering solution or electronics engineering solution the same set of algorithms can be applied to these data set to develop you know either actionable recommendations or predictive models now what happens primarily is why we need a precision approach you know like you know uh, you've heard that you know we, we have a prescription challenge here. You know, we typically go with one, you know, if, you, if a patient is coming into the hospital, typically a doctor recommends, you know, okay, okay, you take this pill and we can, we can see how you will respond to it and depending on the response, we can either give you another medication. What happens is we have, currently have technology that can actually do a small test and then recommend the therapy that you would, that, that most, ideal for your body type that's most ideal for your particular disease so this is the this is the crux of what we call as precision medicine now what happens is like we need to change this approach of you know try and switch to more personalized and data driven approach now there are like infinite possibilities it's a fairly new field which is just getting started we, we you know it's maybe like la around last 10 to 15 years we've been started collecting electronic health data and what i'm going to show you is three ideas one called polygenic risk score the other one is computational diagnostics, and the last one is repositioning. Now, you might have heard about a term called genome. What is a genome? Genome is simply your entire DNA within your cells. So basically, it's made up of four letters, A, T, and G, and C. Depending on whether you have an A or a C in a particular location, that could potentially have a risk for developing a disease. It, the disease could be type 2 diabetes or it could be something like a heart failure, as you know, serious as a heart failure. Now what happens is, using this information, we can do a lot of risk stratification. What that means is I can predict, if you do a small test right now, what's the likelihood of you developing a disease? And then you know, we can use that information to do diagnosis, we can develop what we call as a personal therapy and also help in drug discovery. So polygenic risk score is basically looking at your genetic data and use that information to assess whether, the, whether you have a high risk or a low risk for developing a particular disease. And we ran a, a study, a study called MyGenes, Myocardial Infarction Gene Study. We gave one arm of our patients a typical score called Framingham risk score, the other arm, um, the score along with their genetic data. And what happened was we tracked them for around six months and asked them to come back, and those who received the higher risk genetic score ended up with lower levels of cholesterol, which, which kind of indicates you know, your cardiac health is getting better. What happened is these patients who received the higher risk started taking medications for this. So just one example where information could drive 
better outcomes in patients. Now what happens is, you know, when you go to the diagnosis, you know, you, we all live in a world of instant messaging, instant everything, you know, Instagram and instant everything. And what happens is if you, if you happen to, if you happen to see, uh, uh, you know, done. If you happen to see an X-ray report or something like an MRI or CT scan, X-rays you you get an interpretation right away. But if you do an MRI or a EKG, what happens is it takes a few days to get your report back. You know why? That's because they need to manually interpret that result. And this is a this is a major issue right now. What happens is sometimes the diagnosis could go wrong. And in the US itself, this is the number third. The, medic, the, the medical misdiagnosis is number third reason for death. So this is, the, this is an official data from 2013. And among those reasons, the errors in diagnosis is the top reason for that. So we thought about this problem. Can we capture you know, this very manual process and convert into something like an automated process? We actually did that for one disease. And here it's basically to look at one particular heart condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus you know athlete's heart what that means is if you are a person who who do who do a lot of exercise and kind of perfectly fit your heart muscles will will thicken and at the same time there is a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where your heart muscles will thick as well now what happens is how to differentiate between the two it's a difficult process and need years of experience to interpret between the two images right here. Now we designed a machine learning algorithm that can do this job and do the interpretation within a second. So what happens, we could do the diagnosis precisely and also give the results right away. There is no time to delay or there is no time for, uh, for delay to start the treatment as well. So you could do that and then um, we, 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 we've tested these algorithms and then uh, we have this method available and using machine learning approaches, that's $800 million. And if it's a vaccine, again, around 10 years and $400 million. And the, the challenge with this is, like, let's take, for example, the case of Nipah virus happened, you know, the, 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 out, the outbreak happened. We don't have time, this kind of time, to develop a drug or a vaccine for that. So even though the, this is the typical drug discovery approach, there is something called drug repositioning. So what drug repositioning is, we can use an existing drug and try and see if that drug could be beneficial for any other diseases, you know, that, you know, could be used for any other diseases. And what happened was, I've been working in this field for almost uh, five to six years right now, and there are several examples of you know, published approved drug repositioning candidates. And we, once, one way to actually do the drug repositioning is using a molecular matchmaking approach using gene expression data. What all that means is for every for every disease, we have you know, a signature. For example, if you take type 2 diabetes patients and then look at their gene, you can see that out of the 30,000 genes, a few of them will go up and down compared to the healthy patients. Similarly, for every drug would have an impact on our genes as well. Some of them would go up or some of them would go down depending on the kind of drug that you're using. But we could use a, a, a matchmaking algorithm to match drugs to the diseases. And we've been working on this field. We uh, developed a community resource and, and cataloged around 225 drugs over thousand diseases and it's available right now for everybody to use called repurpose db and this this resource is you know if, if you if let's say if somebody identifies a new repositioning candidate they can also submit that to repurpose db this is the approach that we have actually used in, at that time when we had this outbreak in Kerala, we used drug repositioning approach using the data that was submitted to the biomedical databases by scientists from the last outbreak in Malaysia. 
And what we did was we basically used the computational drug repositioning algorithm, used this study, this publicly available study, and was able to find potential therapies. This includes the top drug was a trihexyphenidyl, which is a Parkinsonian drug, and the top antiviral agents we discovered were ribavirin and meroxidine. And what happens, the message here is the data, the data that we could do this in around you know, seven days and identify this, you know, potential indications for NIPA that was only possible with the power of data and data science. And this data was available in the, in the public domain. That data was available and provided by the researchers in the public domain. And we were able to find a candidate drug for that. So can we use it right away? It all depends on the physician's discretion again. But we were, were able to take NIPA virus from uh, there is no treatment and uh, there is no, no way that our patients could be saved from, from that panicking moment to something like there could be a few potential drugs that we could try on on these patients so that's the whole aspect about repositioning that we could do with the data so I wanted to tell you that like we are in a phase where we have a lot more data available within the healthcare sector and I hope you know you, some of you would think of you know coming into data science and more specifically into biomedical and healthcare data science and you know since everything is connected you know whether you develop a sensor to capture something or you you're interested to how environmental factors associated with the, with a particular disease you can always ask bigger and bolder questions because we have the methods to do that not only like what happened we can answer why did it happen what will happen and how can we make it happen so we can intervene and provide actionable recommendation before any of you by by the time you are becoming 50 you know we could potentially have a diagnostic alert in your phone you're more likely to get a diabetes start a treatment right now you know in another 10 to 15 years so you know in the context of kerala what we could do you know we could potentially be part of an indian genome project or launch a kerala genome project to understand the genomic identity or the genomic signature of all of us we are quite a little bit different from the rest of the indian population or we don't know we we probably have to launch a project to understand that and at the same time you know governments are building you know startup ecosystems and 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 participate in, in interdisciplinary or interdisciplinary projects to get you know uh, experience with this and we are we are moving towards more of smart cities and other things let me tell you without without health you know you cannot be you know uh, ready for a smart city so i hope at least some of you will start thinking about solving your problems in healthcare at least you know work on some startups and that's that's my message for today and before I leave, this is a quote from Steve Jobs. He thinks that the biggest innovation of 21st century could come from the intersection of biology and technology.